So welcome to chapter two of the Top Down Network Design book. This is analyzing technical goals and trade-offs. All right, so technical goals normally are scalability, availability, performance, security, manageability, usability, adaptability, and affordability. So scalability is how much growth a network design must support. Availability is the amount of time the network is available to users often expressed as a percentage of uptime or as a mean time between failure, also known as MTBF, as well as the mean time to repair, MTTR. Availability goals can be documented in any monetary cost associated with cost or network downtime. So there the cost of uh, the network downtime can be presented for an availability goal. Security is the goals of protection, the organizational ability to conduct business without interference from intruders, inappropriately access or damaged equipment, data or operational security, all falls in those same categories. Specific security risks should be documented that way they can be mitigated at a later time. Manageability is a goal for faults, configuration configurations, accountability, performance, and security, also known as FCAPs. Usability deals with the goals regarding the ease in with which the network users can access the network and its services and resources including goals for simplifying user tasks related to the network addressing, naming, and resource discovery. Adaptability is the ease in which the network design uh, can implement, can adapt to network faults, changing traffic patterns, additional businesses or technical requirements, new business practices, and other changes. And lastly is affordability. And that is the importance of containing the cost of associated with purchasing and operating networking equipment and services, as well as resources. <clears throat> so normally we talk technical goals in form of these items. They are specifically defined so that our network can grow. But you'll notice that flexibility is not here even if it was an underlying theme. All right, so moving forward, scalability. It refers to the ability to grow. Some technologies are more scalable than others. For example, a flat network design, it doesn't grow very well, it doesn't scale very well, meaning long-term, it's not there. So when we work on scalability, we're trying to learn Maybe the number of fights that should be added. Maybe look at past growth patterns. Maybe look at what's being discussed for growth for the next year or two. We're also looking at what the needs for each of the individual sites will be. Again, now and in the future. Maybe uh, how many uh, users are expected to be added over the next year or so. How many more nodes, devices, pieces of equipment, servers may be added. All of this is important because this all can tie into growth patterns and making our network flexible enough so that it grows as our needs grow. Availability, normally expressed as a percentage of uptime per year, month, week, day, hour, minute, seconds, all depending. You have to think that availability for resources normally are focusing on how often are they up? For example, 24-7 operations. Network is up 65 hours in the 168 work week. Or maybe availability is presented as, at a percentage. Availability currently sits at 98.21%. Different applications, different requirements, different specifications require different levels of availability. A lot of enterprises may want what they refer to as five nines. 
That means uptime is 99.9999% and that is of time during the work week. A nice breakdown is if we're looking at five nines, we are looking at downtime in minutes. That's five minutes per year. If we are looking at 99.98, we're looking at 105 minutes per year. 99.95, 263 minutes. You see how even though it's 99% uptime, that 99 point, the uh, digits after the decimal kind of make a huge difference because 99.7 that's 100 I'm sorry 1577 minutes that's a lot that's a total of 26 hours but at the same token those five nines are kind of expensive they require a lot of redundancy built into the network and that means more costs. But if uh, your business is making the money, and for example, we took care of a payday loan company, and they calculated that every five minutes they were down, they were losing about $50,000. However, for a network upgrade, it would cost $30,000. But if that new equipment mitigated one downtime, it paid for itself. So the 999999 availability may require things like triple redundancy for ISPs, meaning if one went out, if the second ISP went out, you still have a third ISP to allow for communication. Again, it just kind of depends on the organization. But again, can you afford this? But because of the multiple ISPs, you may have things like addressing issues, autonomous system issues, what about ISPs? Are they separate ISPs? Are those ISPs really using one of their peers for uh, transmitting the data? What about routing protocols? So this adds a whole new level of complexity to all of this. So sometimes redundancy comes with its own issues. So availability can also be expressed as the MTBF and MTTR and that means the availability should equal the mean time between failure divided by the mean time between failure plus the mean time to repair. So for example the network should not fail more than once every 4,000 hours or 166 days and should be fixed within one hour. That will allow you a availability time of 99.98. Network performance. This can be characterized in several different ways. This could be characterized as bandwidth, throughput, utilization, bandwidth utilization, offered load versus overload, accuracy, efficiency, delay or latency, or delay variation and could also be a response time. So bandwidth versus throughput, is there a difference? Bandwidth and throughput are not the same thing. Bandwidth is the data carrying capacity of a circuit, where throughput is the quantity of error-free data transmitted per time of unit. So throughput normally measured in bits per second, bytes per second, or packets per second. So again, bandwidth may be the theoretical maximum, throughput is the actual amount of data going through them. And here is our bandwidth throughput versus load diagram. So our capacity, our throughput, versus our ideal and actual. Other factors that affect throughput could be the size of the actual packet. Are we talking about a regular size 15 uh, byte packet or 1500 byte packet? Are we talking about a jumbo packet? 
Are we talking about inner frame gaps between packets? Could we be talking about the uh, PPPS, the packets per second rating of the devices, and how fast the devices can forward those packets? The load of the devices could be also the design, protocols, distance, errors, time of day, ISP, weather, so forth. All of these factors affect the throughput. Throughput versus good put. Good put you don't normally uh, hear often, but it does exist. You need to decide what you mean by throughput. Are you referring to the bytes per second? Regardless of whether the bytes are user data bytes or packet header bytes? Or are you concerned with application layer throughput? That's the uh, throughput of the user bytes normally called the good puts. Meaning, if we're looking at the data going through our network, are we looking at the entire packet? Are we looking at just the, the user datagram? Are we, or the data portion of the datagram? Or are we talking about the datagram as a whole, including the over information? All of that comes into play, throughput versus good put. Performance or efficiency. How much overhead is required to deliver a specific amount of data? How large should a packet be? How large can it be? How large could it be before there could be data loss? How many packets can be sent in one bunch without any type of acknowledgement, assuming we're using connection-oriented communication, or TCP? So efficiency. If we have several small frames versus several large frames, large frames are more efficient, less overhead. However, if a large frame does uh, need to be resent, that's a large amount of data. So what about the delay from the user's point of view? The response time. And this is a function of the application and the equipment that the application is running on, not just the network. We're looking at that the average user is expecting to see something on the screen within, you know, 100 or 200 milliseconds. We live in an age of right now. So if it's taking too long, even just a half a second, there, it's showing that the response time is not adequate. Delay from the engineer's point of view. And that's going to be the propagation of delay. And that's going to be the signal traveling in a cable is about two-thirds the speed of light in a vacuum, meaning transmission delay, also known as a serialization delay, is the time to put a digital data onto a transmission line, meaning, if you want an example, we are looking at, it takes about five milliseconds to output a 1024 byte packet onto a T1 line. Other forms of delay from the engineer's, the engineer's point of uh, view could be packet switching delay or even querying delay. So querying delay and bandwidth utilization, as we see that as the average utilization goes up, so does the average query depth. Examples. A packet switch has five users, each offering a packet at a rate of 10 packets per second. The average length of the packet is 1024 bits. The packet switch needs to transmit this data over a 56K WAN circuit. So that means our load is we have five users at 10 packets per second. Each packet is about 1024 bits. So we are looking at 51,200 bits per second. Utilization is going to be our load divided by the transmission bandwidth. So here we have our 51,200 divided by our 56k circuit. So that's going to mean we have about an average of 91.4 percent. So that means the average number of packets in Q is around about 10.63 packets.
Delay variation. This is the amount of time delay varied. This could also be known as jitter. This is important when we talk about things like voice, video, audio, because all of these are intolerant to delay. They all have a real-time component. And that's the issue. So forget everything we've said about maximizing packet size, because at this point, our delay is an issue. Security. And normally the focus on requirement first. We're going to talk more about this in Chapter 8. But we need to identify network assets and their values and analyze the appropriate security risks. That way we know how to prioritize our traffic. We may need to know that we have to prioritize HR traffic over everyone else or quality of service for voice or video above everything else. You're going to have to do some type of risk analysis to figure this out. Network assets. They can include things from like hardware, software, applications, data. Data could include things like intellectual property, trade secrets. Uh, it could also be things like reputation. Network assets could be lots of network resources. So you do keep that in mind. Security risks. Hacked network devices is a normal risk. Data can be intercepted, analyzed, altered, or deleted in transit. Things like user passwords could be compromised. Reconnaissance of an attack, or even things like denial of service. All of these are huge security risks. So we have to be implementing some type of security measures to mitigate these risks. Manageability. Things like managing the fault tolerance of the network. Managing the configuration, accountability, the performance, and the security. All of those fo uh, focus on the manageability of the overall network. Usability. Again, usability is the ease at which we can use the resources. Networks should make the user's job easier, not more complicated. Some design decisions will have a negative effect on usability. For example, strict security makes it harder for the users to use it. Adaptability. Avoid incorporating any design elements that would make it hard to implement new technologies for the future. That's pretty straightforward. We need to keep a more fluid, flexible design so that we can adapt to changing. That's changes in technology, that's changing in traffic patterns, and that also could be changing for quality of service. Adaptability and flexibility are huge because again, our network is going to be fluid. It's going to change as our requirements change. Affordability. The network should carry the maximum amount of traffic possible for a given financial cost. All of this equipment is going to cost something. So we have to have the appropriate type of design where we're going to have the most bandwidth, most resource availability, most things for our money. And affordability is especially important when we start talking about campus area network designs, CANs. Same thing with WANs, because WANs are expected to cost more, but costs can be reduced based off of the proper use of technology. WANs are separate from CANs, which are separate from LAN, and they're all going to have their unique characteristics. Network application technical requirements is a great little flowchart. So we can actually do the, uh, we rank them, name of application, cost of downtime, the acceptable MTVF, the acceptable MTDR, throughput, delay, variation. That way we can start ranking our different applications and our different technical requirements. That way we have a better way to categorize our overall strategy for the network. For example, making trade-offs. If scalability is going to be 20% of our focus and availability is going to be 30% of our focus, network performance 15, security 5, the rest of them all 5, we can make trade-offs. That way security may be increased, but that means we're going to have to lower 
the rank of another item. For example, if security is a huge, but scalability is not that important, we may lower scalability down and increase security up to 10. So again, this is all making the trade-offs for your specific situation. So in summary, we're going to continue to use a systematic top-down approach. We're not going to select products. Our goal here is to understand things like scalability, availability, performance, security, manageability, usability, adaptability, and affordability. Trade-offs are almost always necessary as an end result. We're not going to have unlimited resources, so we have to be able to spend more wisely. I want to end you guys with some review questions and thoughts. So, first review question. What are some typical technical goals for organizations today? How much bandwidth and throughput differ? How can one improve network efficiency? And what trade-offs may be necessary in order to improve network efficiency? That's all I have for Chapter 2. Thank you. Welcome to my top-down network design, Chapter 4. In this chapter, we're looking at characterizing the network traffic. This actually is not really that long of a chapter, so that's kind of nice. So, network traffic factors, we have to understand traffic flow. How does traffic flow in our network? Again, you're going to have to look at this from a design or architect point of view, not so much as a router switch type of person. While you do have to understand flow of data from a router switch perspective, but it's more than just that. You also have to look at things like location of the traffic source and the data stores. Are we putting data uh, or resources that are being heavily accessed on a slower backbone network? Are we putting them on older switches? Are we centralizing them? Where are we putting them and how does that relate to resource flow from them. So those are kind of important. Traffic load. Uh, do we have one key port that is actually becoming a point of failure? Do we have one port that actually is accessing the vast majority of, the, of our data or data stores or resources? Uh, for example, I did one design where or one review where they had a nice th uh, three-tiered structure, access, distribution, and core. But on a lot of the distributions to their core, they did one, up, uh, one uplink. And all of their servers were in their core, which that's not bad, but all of the basic access traffic that needed access to those resources had to travel to the distribution and from that one distribution switch had one uplink to the core. So that one uplink was heavily saturated. So that was, became a, a concern. Traffic behavior, that's also another big one. Uh, peaking times, uh, what areas, what times, what days uh, does traffic behave uh, differently? That's not really hard to, to monitor or figure out. So that's kind of important one to know as well as are there any type of QoS or COS requirements? So they're all big ones. So user community is another big one. Uh, departments, groups, the size of them, locations, maybe applications, if they're sensitive or not. Data stores, again, what data stores are being accessed, what resources, location, what applications, things of that nature as well as who's using them, because they're all kind of important. That gets you an overview of how the network flow is, is happening. And again, general network flow, where they're going, where they're going, things of that nature. Why is that important? big part of that is so that you can do a map like this. So you can figure out bandwidth that's going to be needed. Now again, here we're, lo we're talking about kilobits per second. This is a little bit more unrealistic because, again, with current developments in networking, we're talking megs, we're talking 100 gigabits, 10 gig, 40 gig, things of that nature. But again, this is still a really good example of how you do basic design. 
understanding how to design a CAN, campus area network. What buildings? What are the applications being ran in the building? How much bandwidth they're going to need? Again, bandwidth totals aren't going to be in the kilobits, but same principle applies. Types of traffic flow, again, are they going to be uh, terminal, uh, terminal services, remote management, client server, some type of VDI or thin client, client server, server to server, uh, replication, syncing, maybe some type of clustering or database management, uh, virtualized servers, virtualizing hardware, virtualizing network infrastructure, virtualizing desktops or things of that nature. So again, there's lots of things when it comes to different types of data flow. We haven't even touched any type of voice because the voice and video both have a real time component. So the flow associated with the transmission of these, they take on a whole new layer of complexity. Because again, this real time cannot have a delay. A phone needs to talk to a server or switch so that the phone numbers and addressing can function so that the end users can actually do phone calls. We were acting one incident where our network design kind of broke down and due to a, a switch installation that was gone wrong and all of our voice VLAN started disappearing. So our phone system got all wonky for four days and no one knew why. It was not a project that I was working with. It was more of a, I worked as a faculty member there and the network engineer pointed out the issue. So this, this does happen in real life. So you do want to make sure that you have the appropriate traffic flow maps and things of that nature. Application based off of traffic characteristics. Again, QoS requirements, protocols, types of traffic, what resources, name of application, all of this type of things are important because all of this goes back to how do we actually categorize, organize our data structure? How do we organize our network? How do we know it's real traffic, abnormal traffic, traffic that just randomly occurs? How do we know? We, without this type of documentation, we don't. Traffic load could be the number of workstations, could be average latency time to access a resource, or could just be a uh, load on those pieces of equipment, the load on the switch, the load on the router, the load on the link, as it communicates with different layers. All of these become important information that you have to be able to detail. Size of objects on the network. Again, these numbers are kind of realist are unrealistic. Some of them maybe. But we're talking megs and hundreds of megs and gigs and things of that nature. Because this is more of the transmission and storage. So we have to remember bits versus bytes. And how much data are we passing on the network? For example, a simple web page. It may only be 50 kilobytes. But then the communication of that web page has to go through some type of kilobit per second connection or megabit per second or gigabit per second or so forth. But we have to understand the size of the objects that we're sending and receiving. Again, everything goes back to that documentation. Traffic flow, whether it be a broadcast, multicast, or any cast, or heck, even unicast. Because this right now is only focusing on IPv4, hence the broadcast. Again, understanding the broadcast domains, understanding the collision domains. This is important because if you're using older technology like switches and hubs in your environment, this is going to affect your environment. Understanding the broadcast domains. If we have one large broadcast domain like a campus area network, it's campus wide, and a PC sends the broadcasts, there's a wasted resources going everywhere just because the improper segmentation of broadcast domains. That's a huge thing. All right, network efficiency. That could be things like overhead because of link failure, overhead because of retransmission, overhead because of things like frame sizing. Are we using the traditional 1500 MPU? Are we using a jumbo frame? 
Are we dealing with certain protocols that have overhead? What about windowing or error recovery mechanisms if a collision does happen? Again, we've already talked about these in previous chapters, but these are all things that you have to think about when you're talking about efficiency. Uh, CO, sorry, QoS and COS requirements. Things like, are we looking at a constant bit rate, a real-time bit rate? Are we looking at available bit rate? Are we talking about a guaranteed bit rate or frame rate? All of these get brought into play when we're looking at certain services. While this particular service is more looking at the ATM service specification, these can still apply to other services, real-time versus non-real-time, constant versus guaranteed versus availability. All of these come into play, so we have to keep that in mind. We have to understand the flow of traffic in our network so that we can understand what is our constant bit rate per day, per time, time area, during peak time versus non-peak time. All of these are critical. Then we have QoS requirements per the IETF group. And again, that's going to be guaranteed services or load services that are going to be more controlled. Again, it just kind of depends on how we're doing it. If we're doing guaranteed, it will provide a firm mathematical provable bounds on end-to-end -end querying, where the controlled load balancing provides client data so you can approximate it. So again, we have to pick and choose what's going to be the right type of tool for our environment. The IETF does differentiate services work groups based off a of specific uh, RFC, it should be 2475, as well as the way that we can uh, categorize our packets. That's going to be the differentiated service code points, or DSCP, and how that influences or works with the querying and the drop decisions for our IP datagrams. That's actually it for this chapter. Again, we want to make sure that you have a good understanding of flow, load, behavior, and general QoS requirements. I want to leave you with some review questions. You want to look at some of the common different types of traffic. You want to make traffic flow and voice over IP a challenging based off the characteristics and plan for it. Voice over IP or other real-time traffic. Why should you be concerned about broadcasts or any casts or multicasts? And how do ATM and EFTF specifications for QoS differ? That one's not super, super important anymore because ATM is more of a, an outdated technology. But again, Understanding how IFTF specifications for QoS differs from other variations, that's the point here. I want to thank you for your time. Chapter 8, Developing Network Strategies. This is always a fun chapter. So our author had a 12-step program. First, identify network assets. Analyze the security risks to those assets. Analyze security requirements and trade-offs. Big part of section three is every security requirement will have trade-offs. How available versus how secure is always one of the trade-offs. Fourth, develop a security plan that is realistic. Once we have a security plan in place, we can start uh, thinking about defining individual security policies. Develop procedures for applying those security policies. Seven, develop a technical implementation strategy. This, just because we have a security policy and strategy doesn't mean that we're going to have the feature set to install uh, the technical components of that security program. For example, install firewall. Okay, that's pretty straightforward, but do we have the technical capacity or the technical knowledge in order to properly implement that firewall within our overall design? That's why step 11, or step 7 is there. Step 8, achieve. 
buy-in from the users, the managers, technical staff, and all other stakeholders of the organization. You have to have everyone on board in order for these programs to be successful. Step nine, train users, managers, and technical staff in policies and procedures that we have developed. Step 10, implement the techno, uh, tech, uh, step 10, implement the technical strategy and security procedures. That can only really be done after buy-in and training. Step 11, test the security and update if necessary, or if there's any problems that are found. Step 12, maintain security. I like to also think that maintain security is sometimes test and update as necessary as part of the regular maintenance. So, what are some network assets? Network assets could be any hardware, software application, data requirements, intellectual property, secrets, or even could be the company's reputation. All of those are components of a network asset or assets for an organization. So what do we mean by security risks? It could be as simple as hacked at network devices. What data can be intercepted? How can we analyze, altered, or deleted? Could there be something in place to prevent that? A great example that I've just ran into, at my day job, we've been talking about how to uh, implement ARPA poisoning and how simple it is to actually uh, do art poisoning. And so we know that those types of devices could be hacked. We've been looking at ways to mitigate that risk. For example, dynamic ARP inspection, DAI. However, we don't run DAI. Even though we've been able to show how easy it is to use ARP uh, poisoning, our network engineers viewed the risk of art poisoning is so low that we should not have to worry about it. Other security risks could be reconnaissance or other types of DOS or DDoS attacks. Decks. Also, could be man in the middle attacks because we already talked about data intercepted, analyzed, and altered. What about data integrity? Those are all good risk factors to think about. Risk trade-offs. Within any uh, form of security, we have trade-offs. The trade-offs between the security goals and other goals. For example, affordability. Let's make things super secure, but can we afford to? That's always a fun one. Usability. If we make it so tight, so secure, is it still usable? What about performance? Realistically, if we make our VoIP so secure, yet we're not able to make phone calls, does that defeat the purpose of that technology? Next, availability. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. We need to have our resources available, but if we make it too secure that nothing is available, we're not meeting our security goal. Lastly, manageability. That's pretty straightforward. So an example of a trade-off is that the security can reduce network redundancy. If all network traffic must go through an encrypted device, for example, we may have one firewall, and that becomes a single point of failure. That defeats the purpose of being secure. Next, security plan. A security plan is normally a high-level document that proposes that an organization is going to do to meet specific security requirements. That could also include times, duties, people, and resources that may be required to develop the policies and how those policies will achieve the implementation of those policies. How could those policies and the implementation of those policies also meet the overall security goal or objective that our plan is supposed to be meeting. Security policy. Per a, one of the RFCs, RFC 2196, a site security handbook, 
is a security policy is a formal statement of the rules by which given access to an organization's technology and information assets must abide. But at the same time, we actually have to have a site security handbook, and most organizations don't. Most organizations have a written policy for those that do, but they're not enforceable or they're not enforced. So, a policy should address the access, accountability, authentication, privacy, and technologies, but should also talk about things like enforcement. How are we going to enforce our policy? Us having a rule but never enforcing it? There's no good for that rule. Security mechanisms could be our AAA, authentication, authorization, accounting, could also be physical access, for example, access control or magnetic locks or locking doors. Uh, locking doors could also be technology assets like data encryption, filtering software, firewalls, IDSs slash IPSs. Those are all good ones. So let's talk about encryption for a second. Since we already talked about our AAA, what about our CIA? Confidentiality, integrity and availability. How do we know that our data is going to be encrypted? This could be a public and private key system or PKI system. We encrypt data between our hosts. That way one has a private key, one has a public key and that data is going to be encrypted in transit and you use the traded keys, the public keys to decrypt the data. It's always a good way to verify that data being transmitted will not be able to be compromised, thus confirming the confidentiality of the message as well as the integrity of the message. So how do we modularize our security design? First, it has to be a multi-layer approach. You cannot have a single layer. So we built multi layers into our security so that if one layer fails, there's another layer they still have to penetrate. Built in suspender, uh, sup suspenders approach, pretty much you don't get caught with your pants down. You have plenty of layers to provide overall protection. Part of that modulizing our security design involves securing all the components. That means our, our network connections, our public servers and uh, e-commerce services could be, are they part of the network? Are they part of the DMZ? Where, are they, where do they belong? That talks about encrypting or securing our remote access and our VPNs. Anything that's getting into our network should be a monitored, should be secured. Also, what network services are required to run? If they don't work, are, if they don't have to run, are they being ran? If they are key component to our network services, are they being secured appropriately? What about the servers? Are the servers being verified and secured? End users. Are user services being secured, both by technical support staff, securing the services that our users may need, but what about our users as a service? Are our users being trained in the way of our security policy? One of the next big things is wireless. Is our wireless secure? So Cisco does have a Cisco safe security reference module that does address security in every modular of a modular network architecture. That way, using this older plan, you can actually secure each area. So, first one, securing internet connection. That could be physical security. That could include firewalls and packet filterings, AAA, authentication authorization availability. Could also be uh, auditing of logs well-defined uh, exit and entry points, 
into the facility, into our network equipment, as well as are our routing and switching protocols secured. That's always a big one because many organizations fail to do that. Securing our public resources. For example, securing servers in a DMZ, running firewalls on the servers themselves, as well as a dedicated device, using reliable and up-to-date security or operating systems that are uh, up-to-date on their security patches. Security experts recommend that FTP services not run on the same server as web services. It just happens to be that FTP users have more opportunities for reading and possibly changing files than web users do. There are hacks out there that allow FTP users to escalate their privileges on a web server. So those are things to consider. Security topology. Making sure we have the appropriate services as appropriate machines. Web, file, DNS, mail servers. Are they all on one server or are they separated? Not so much virtual versus physical servers, but is there a virtual machine each one, for each one of these services? Is there a physical server? Should it be this type of flat file system? As opposed to this one. Our DMZ is tied off of our firewall. And that's its own little branch. It's just like the rest of our enterprise network. And even here, there may be a dual firewall put in place. So there could be a firewall in between the router and the internet. Then the router. Then another firewall between the DMZ and the internet. Cisco loves to put firewalls in very key areas. Next, securing our remote access. Again, that's physical security. As our protecting our firewalls, our VPN servers, other remote access devices, could be one-time tokens, could also be security protocols like CHAP or RADIUS or DACTUS. AAA is also brought up again here. Physical security is going to be in a lot of these areas, but verifying that each area has the appropriate security measures to protect them. Securing network uh, services. Treat each network device as a high value host and harden it. Pay attention to which device you're using default passwords and get rid of them. How are you uh, securing connecting to those devices? Are you allowing Telnet? If not, are you allowing for secured SSH? Change the welcome banner to the appropriate Less welcome banner, like authorized access only. Securing our server farms. Is there a firewall? Is there an IDS slash IPS monitoring the servers? Are the servers kept up to date? Are the accounts appropriate? Are there weak passwords on those servers? Those are all things to consider. What about securing user services? That could also include, include things like applications. Are the PCs uh, having a firewall ran on them? Are the antiviruses running and active and up to date? How are the antiviruses to begin with? Here we could also implement a written policy that specify how the software is installed as well as what software is installed. If we're worried about physical security on our user services, we could consider 802.1x port-based security on our switches. That way, port security could control port access to our individual devices. What about securing our wireless network? That could be as simple as setting the wild wireless on their own uh, VLAN or subnet, simplifying the address, making them different addresses, filtering, adding in a radius server for authentication of wireless users. 
require all wireless laptops to run personal firewalls or uh, also include antiviruses. Both Windows, uh, Microsoft products, and Cisco have NAC network access control or NAP network access protection so that if a wireless device gets on the network and they'll verify the personal firewall and antivirus is up to date. If not, they get placed into an appropriate VLAN to reduce the risk of security. Not a lot of companies that I've ran into use NAC or NAP, but those are all uh, key things in wireless, securing wireless security. That could also be wireless security as in what wireless uh, encryption are they running? Are they running WEP? Are they running WPA? WPA2? Is the WPA or WPA2 uh, personal or enterprise? Is radius tied here? That's all big other things. WEP is poor, but if that's what you have, it's better than nothing. But it's pretty weak. You can Google how to break web encryption and break web encryption within a few WPA2 is a nice alternative. Normally, it uses Advanced Encryption Standard, AES, which is a 256-bit key. This is better. However, it's not as good as WPA2 and WPA. It's already shown you could break into it 20-30 minutes. Part of this could also be including EAP, Intensive Authentication Protocols. That so we can couple our 802.1x with our EAP. This allows us to run things like RADIUS. Forcing our wireless clients to authenticate against our RADIUS server. That way, we could pass credentials from our wireless access, from our wireless users, to our wireless access control, to a server running our RADIUS server. That way, they could pass the credentials and verify if they're allowed on the network. If that's too protocol heavy, Cisco has a lightweight EAP that allows for mutual authentication. That way the user and the access point must be authenticated. That way you can verify that you're truly authenticating your wireless user against the appropriate uh, Cisco device that is then authenticating against the appropriate RADIUS device. There are a plenty of other EAP types out there but Cisco and Microsoft really push the leap and peep, the protected EAP. And all of that is encrypted traffic to the RADIUS server. We could also talk about software on our wireless clients. If we're already assuming that our wireless clients are secured, what about the VPN software on the wireless clients? Are they secure? Are we uh, verifying that passwords and credentials aren't being saved? That's part of the VPN security. And that's actually a key thing here. VPN security to verify that our mobile users are tunneling into our network so that they can securely transmit and receive sensitive data or just data in general. That's actually it for chapter eight. So I, I hope you guys took here security plans, policies and procedures, and the different mechanisms for keeping them in place. I wanted to thank you and hope you guys have a great day. Okay, so I wanted to discuss some follow-up items. One of the first things is our APA formatting and citation. That goes for both our IPs and our discussions. Remember that we have to do all of our work according to APA manual. So if you're not sure how to do that, go online. Uh, you can type in APA formatting. 
uh, if you don't want to look it up online you can go to any of the tutorial services we have a writing we have a library service they can give you additional resources on how to do APA formatting that's important that's not going away uh, in discussions same thing we have to be doing our citations in our discussions because one of the big things is for our citations, we're building off of other people's works. So it's a way for us to verify what we're claiming is supported by the literature. So when I say something at the sky is blue, you can take my word for it. Or if I provide a citation, you can take an expert's word for it. And then I build off of that. So it just kind of increases your credibility we should be at least citing in every uh, post or as much as possible because again we're trying to link what we've done back to the literature same thing in our IPs every paragraph should be uh, tied to a source every paragraph is an idea and every idea we need to have support within the literature and I know at this level it's not that big of an issue but you want to get in the habit of doing that so when you start doing higher level work it's second nature also length we don't need posts that are great job I mean don't get me wrong it does add to it but when I start grading for posts I'm not doing uh, full credit for those that have three posts and two of them are great jobs I don't count the great jobs as a post. For our discussion board, I'm looking for three solid responses with citations. Uh, for our papers, I'm looking for three pages of content with citations. So what I mean by content is that's three papers on topic. That's not a cover page, that's not your reference page, that's three content pages. Uh, two if you're really good, but I'm really looking for three. If you're doing uh, diagrams, diagrams totally are okay, as long as you're doing them within APA formatting. Lastly, grading. Again, I grade off of heavily off of attempt, like if you're putting an effort into it. Like if you did two pages and you did a few citations and I could see that you were making an effort I'll, I'll meet you but if you post once or you did a page and a half with one citation you know that really isn't you making an effort uh, if you get stuck don't get me wrong some people a page is a lot if you get stuck you have plenty of resources to bolster up your paper you can contact me I'll help you if you don't want to contact me, we have a writing uh, center, we have a tutorial, uh, tutorial center, we have plenty of help for you to get. If you need tutoring, there's a lot of tutoring out there, and uh, again, provided from the school. All you have to do is say something. For our tutorial lab, we have tutor uh, tutorial services for SQL, we have tutorial services for database, we have tutorial services for math, English, writing research, library services, I mean we have a great amount of tutorial services. And if we don't offer tutoring in a specific area, you can ask for it specifically and they will find tutors for you. So you cannot use, you cannot get tutoring because you can. If you ask for help, the school will get it. If you cannot get it from the school, there's other help. I will sit down with you. I will do as much as as much as I can with you if you need one on one. If you need tutoring and you don't get tutoring, that's not a failure on my part. That's not a failure on the school's part. That's only a failure on your part because there's plenty of opportunities there. You have my number, you have my email, you have two emails from me, you have my cell phone number. You have plenty of ways to get a hold of me if you need help. And again, if you don't capitalize on help and you need help that's on you that's on you 
Because there's plenty of help out there. All you have to do is say something. Thank you.